That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Has anyone ever said that to you? Or about something that you believe or something that is important to you? To some, it really seems silly that we could be forgiven just because someone died on a cross a couple thousand years ago. They say it's silly. How could forgiveness in heaven be free, a free gift? How do you feel? How do you feel when someone questions one of the major teachings of your faith or suggests that everything that you really believe in and trust in concerning our God is silly or maybe nonsense? And don't think this doesn't happen. You know, it's easy here to say that we believe in Jesus. It's easy here in this place to say that we believe in the triune God because we're all on the same page. We believe and confess, as we did a moment ago, that the triune God is the true God, our God. But for many people, the doctrines of the Christian faith are actually upsetting. They're actually disturbing to those who don't believe them. And sure, there's those people that say, well, you know, you can believe what you want, live and let live. But there are also those who start to study the scriptures and Christianity and uh, they understand what Christianity actually teaches and they are often upset. They're angered or offended. And they will sometimes tell you that you are foolish to put your trust and belief in such silliness. This isn't a sermon about those people, by the way. This is a sermon about us. What does it do to us when someone tells us that our faith is nonsense? We are tempted, of course, not just by such attacks, but by even by our own minds to place our reason before faith, to place our own ideas and thoughts before the very word of God. And when we do this, when we, when we put reason before the word of God, when we put our own thoughts before the word of God, we usually come to the wrong conclusion about these things. Now Martin Luther called reason the devil's bride. And Martin Luther called reason the greatest enemy of the faith. One quote attributed to Luther reads this way, Reason must be deluded, blinded, and destroyed. Faith must trample underfoot all reason, sense, understanding, and whatever it sees must be put out of sight and know nothing but the word of God. So Dr. Luther agrees with St. Paul of the New Testament that the message of the cross is foolishness or a scandal that it is utterly unreasonable when you start to dissect it and you take it apart. But to us, St. Paul says, to us who believe, who are being saved, it is a different story. To us who are being saved, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And still there is this conflict within us. You see, so often uh, sin seems so reasonable. Think about it for a few moments this morning. Just a little cheating here won't hurt anyone. A little lying there and, and no one is going to know about it. I'll get rid of this inconvenience and I'll ignore the word of God. It's just not practical right now. God's ways don't really make sense to us. Wouldn't it be better to do it my way? I know God said, don't eat from that tree in the garden. But it looks so good and I want to be wise. God said, honor your father and your mother, but they just don't know how difficult it is to be a teenager these days. God said, do not give up meeting together, but I could really use a day off this weekend for myself. God said, pray for your enemies, but I really hate that guy. God said, love your neighbor as yourself, but I don't really love that person, and it doesn't seem worth it that person doesn't seem worth it and the list goes on and on and on we heard the ten commandments in the old testament lesson today reminding us of god's law 
But in reality, sin is entirely unreasonable. How many times do we do what's wrong and actually know that it's wrong? We know better than that. Even though we, we know we might get caught, or we know that we will pay the consequences one way or another, we still do it. Even though we know, we know that sin brings death and it brings pain and it brings punishment, we, we go there. We go and we sin for some inexplicable reason. Sinful and corrupted reason must bow to the foolishness of God. What we think and what we think we know must always come after what God says is true, even if it seems unreasonable. And thank God for such foolishness. What kind of God would do what he does? Think about that for a moment. He came down from heaven born as a human he was mocked he suffered he died he forgives sinners he loves people who hate him he did it all for people who do everything but his will and saint paul says that god uses the weak things of this world to shame the strong and there is no one stronger in this world than satan himself and there is nothing weaker than dying in humility on a cross and there are some people who actually point that out in their religion how could you have a God how could you have a Jesus who went to the cross what kind of God is that and there it is foolishness the foolishness of God it's the cross the cross you see, we live in an increasingly intolerant and hostile society that is actually offended by the cross. The world has no use for the cross. Maybe you see it worn as jewelry, like a lucky charm, like a rabbit's foot. The world wishes that Jesus had remained in the tomb. The world does not want to accept the reality of Jesus Christ. The world doesn't want to admit that by his death and resurrection, he showed himself to be the only way, the truth, and the life. And the world considers it foolishness that one man would be the only way to heaven and seeks to kill him again. That's what the world does, as if that could be possible. And so Paul talks about the debaters of the world, the wise in the world. The wise and the debaters of this world put forth false gods, yet their gods are only actually working for the devil. Mohammed did not die for you. Buddha is still dead. Vishnu has not risen from the dead. The triune God is not just one God of many gods, but the only God, the only God that can help us. When we preach the cross, it offends because the gospel offends. And St. Paul says it is a scandal. Now, it's a message that, that kills the unbeliever. Now, the word scandal comes from the Greek language, and a scandal is really a stick. It's the stick that's used to prop open a, a trap. And when an animal tripped the stick and then sprang the trap, it would become scandalized, that animal, or fatally captured. It would bleed to death, unable to free itself. The Greek word is scandalon, and it is really any impediment that causes a person to fall, like a rock, if you trip over a rock, or anything that causes a person to be entrapped. And so when a politician or an athlete gets caught doing something wrong, it is a scandal, and they can lose their job. In a similar way, this is what happens to someone who hears the preaching of the cross and then takes offense and considers it to be foolish or nonsense. That unbeliever is caught in his own trap. It's the trap of the religion of the law, the religion of good works. They think there is no way that Jesus could pay for their sins. There must be something that I can do. Maybe, maybe I can meet Jesus halfway. So it's part Jesus and part me, but I have a part in it. I must somehow try to be better on my own to reach up to God. It even happens to us, those who believe, when we who are believers want to hear something better. We get tired of hearing the gospel 
Oh, we come week after week and, oh, it's the same story. Jesus died on the cross for you, for me. It's because we think that we are smarter than the gospel. Simple forgiveness through the death of Christ seems to be naive. It is a plague that eats away at our soul because its basic thinking is that we can get to heaven if we are just good enough. And even for the Christian, that thought comes back again and again. We may think that we're wise, looking for something better, but this looking for something better makes us all the more foolish. Rather than looking to God's word, we look to ourselves, looking for a sign, some kind of some kind of a message, another message. A message that's outside of God's grace that comes to us through his word and his sacraments. But here we continue to preach Christ crucified. Because it's the only way. It's the only wisdom for foolish sinners. And it's the only power for those of us who are weakened even to death. Jesus dies for you and he dies for me and for all. And the Lord of life died that we would have life. That sounds foolish. But it's true. It is the wisdom of God. And so we bear the sign of the cross that marks us as forgiven by Christ, the crucified. And we have borne that sign of the cross since the day of our baptism when we became members of the family of God. And we lift high that cross, telling others that message of the cross so that they too by the power of the holy spirit would actually no longer be offended that they would not be scandalized but that they would be set free to be people of god and so this is the message this is the message that we preach in this place here at saint peter This is the word that we get to share and hear every weekend. This is the good news that we get to tell others when we leave this place after the service is over and the final amen is said. In a dose of further foolishness, God does something else. He turns things upside down again. Now he brings Jesus from death to life, back from the dead. Whoever thought Whoever thought of that? What worldly wisdom could have predicted it? It is against all reason and wisdom and common sense, but it is by such foolishness that you and I are actually saved from our sins and given the gift of heaven. Now, some years ago, there was a a college that had originally been started by the Presbyterian uh, Church. And it was a very Bible-based college. It taught the scriptures. They decided recently, some, but some time ago, not too long ago, to take down the two crosses that were on that campus. The college had become liberal and changed its way of thinking and, and it had become worldly and it had moved away from the Christian heritage that it had. And the crosses were taken down because they were seen as a stumbling block, a scandal to the students who now attended. And so the crosses were seen as bad for the image of the college and they didn't want to offend any of the new students that were coming in. We pray that we will always be able to lift high that cross of Jesus Christ here in our church, in our lives, in our district, in our synod, throughout the world as we proclaim the love of Christ to a world that still needs him. Yes, we can say with St. Paul, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.